Welcome to this Religion Media Centre briefing, which is um, on the recent gathering of the General Synod of the Church of England in July. And we're asking the question, is the Church of England governable? Because it was one of the most fractious events that people can remember. Uh, one member of the Synod told my colleague Rosie Dawson, it's really all blown up in our faces. No one can remember a Synod like it. At one point, if you were following things, the proceedings were suspended to allow two SAC members of the Independent Safeguarding Board to speak, and the synod process had to be suspended to allow all that to happen. There are accusations of people being deliberately silenced, of the debates and the agenda being manipulated, and the archbishops were even accused of misleading or even lying at one point. It doesn't get more lively than that. So what does that synod tell us about the state of the Church of England? Uh, we're joined by various members of the Synod who've kindly joined us and commentators who've been looking at afar, trying to make sense of what's happened. Um, and I'm particularly uh, glad to welcome Francis Martin, who's a reporter at the Church Times, who followed its every move in York. And Francis, with your help, perhaps we can get some facts out there and talk about what actually happened. So, first of all, first question, what was the mood you picked up when you were reporting the Synod at York this time? Well, as you, as you mentioned, a fracture um, is a good word to describe it. I think there was um, a lot of frustration as well. I think that contributed to that sense of fractiousness. Um, many members pointed out that the agenda had really very little of, um, not precisely of substance in it. There was plenty of substance, almost too much substance in it. But there was very little for the, for the members of the Synod to actually decide. Um, they were hearing a lot. They were able to ask questions, but there was very limited amount they could even they could actually do. There were a few debates. There were, it was mainly presentations or a lot of presentations. The debates that actually happened were um, on governance, for example. It was really very little of substance there. It was it was very much sort of just pushing it through to the next stage and with promised discussion later on. I know we're going to talk about governance later, but I think that that Second. sense of frustration Second. contributed a lot to that. To that atmosphere. So just to pick up the point you make there about the report on governance, which was towards the end of the of the gathering, but he, uh, Sir David Liddington, who uh, wrote this 68 page report, talked about what he detected, which he was surprised about, which was the level of mistrust in the church. Can you paraphrase what he found? Well, it, it, indeed, just that really. I mean, he to, to quote from him rather than to paraphrase, he, he talked about a significantly eroded confidence and trust in the support and services that the national church institutions um, provide and went into some detail as to the reasons behind that. Um, the fact that national church institutions are quite a complex um, array of bodies currently um, or with a sort of degree of semi-independence um, and semi-reliance on each other. Um, the role of Synod uh, in scrutinising the work of those institutions as well was uh, an aspect that he highlighted as a cause for, you know, something that was, it was a cause for concern. And certainly that came out very strongly at the meeting of Synod, um, a real frustration again by members that they couldn't um, have oversight and, and a sense that they were being managed. This, this phrase came up several times, the idea that Synod was being managed um, by principally the Archbishop's Council, but um, it, you know, the National Church Institutions um, as a whole uh, implicated in that, in that process. So we're going to look at two uh, of the most contentious issues to see how that played out. The first was safeguarding and that extraordinary scene on Sunday afternoon where proceedings were, were stalled, well, stopped for 25 minutes while people decided how they were going to deal with this. And then the two speeches from two independent safeguarding board members who uh, had been sacked, Jasvinda Sangira and Steve Reeves. Um, when that happened, can you tell me what you saw and what you were talking to people about afterwards and how people responded to what 
what was going on. There were discussions at one point, the Archbishop of York went up into the gallery to talk to members to, to find out what was happening. What did you see? It was it was a strange, it was a, it was an extraordinary session of Synod. Um, I suspect quite difficult to follow on the live stream. I, um, I was there in person, which, which helped. Um, so we could see more of what was going on. Um, and, you know, it, it followed this presentation from the Archbishop's Council in which they um, tried to explain or defend uh, the decisions that have been taken um, and it give an indication of what might happen going forward. Um, there was a huge desire to hear from Jasvinder Sangera and Steve Reeves. Very powerful desire. They were there in the, in the gallery. Um, and the this sort of protracted process by which it took um, several points of order, several different um, approaches before they were able to have 10 minutes to speak. Um, it, it wasn't the best advert for any kind of synodical process or uh, governance uh, process, put it, to, to put it quite mildly, I suppose. Thank you. So can I move to Andrew Greystone now? Andrew, you're uh, an advisor on safeguarding and representing various survivors in in the church. Um, you were up there with uh, Sangira and uh, Steve Reeves as this discussion was taking place. On reflection, do you think that Synod was the best vehicle for their views to be shared? Uh, absolutely not. I mean, I would say I'm not an advisor on safeguarding. I'm merely an advocate, somebody who tries to walk with victims and survivors. Um, clearly, Steve Reeves and Jasvinder Sangera have seen a dimension of the church that isn't available to many people, even to many people on Archbishop's Council. I've had people on Archbishop's Council speaking to me in the in the week since then um, and displaying a real ignorance of what's going on. Um, uh, but they, they needed to be heard, that voice needed to be heard, but to give them, they, they were initially reluctant to speak because they were given um, no notice in a, a very highly charged situation. Um, of course, they've already said much of what they wanted to say in reports to the church that have been largely ignored. Um, Jasvinda Sangera wrote a report in December. The church hasn't responded to that. And crucially, they had delivered a report in April on the one report that they had completed on behalf of a survivor who's become known as Mr. X. The church hadn't responded to that and still hasn't responded uh, to that report and nothing has been done for that um individual so one of the situations that the church is left in is survivors extremely angry um speaking to me this morning extremely angry and most of them that, that i know of saying we won't and can't cooperate with the church until they've done something for mr x why would we get involved in some new project when the church hasn't yet fulfilled what it um what it had set out on with Mr X. What has broken down in the governance of safeguarding to have led to that level of anger? The model of safeguarding in the Church of England doesn't work um, for a number of reasons. One is because uh, the church is so uh, disparate in its authority. It's made up of hundreds, probably thousands of individual charities. Each diocese, each cathedral, each parish church is a charity. The Archbishop's Council is a separate charity, and that gives deniability to every um, bit of the church. Every bit can say, well, it's not my responsibility, it's someone else's. So if you talk to the Director of Safeguarding, National Director of Safeguarding in the Church of England, he will say, oh, there's very little I can do. If you talk to the Archbishops, they will say, well, I don't have the power to intervene. Well, it's in that kind of chaos that, um, predatory uh, uh, abusers really flourish. Um, there's, there's endless opportunity for uh, abuse to happen when there isn't uh, clarity of, of management. And I don't know how that um, can now be achieved 
the, the church's structures are chaotic. Will anything improve, though, with simply a change of governance structure? There's no doubt there's huge personal uh, mistrust now. I mean, you're talking about people who have been victims of or have survived abuse by people wearing dog collars, people wearing mitres. If you've been abused by a clergy person or a bishop, the job of recreating any kind of trust in the institution that that person represented is a massive uphill struggle anyway. And the, 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 the attitude that we get from the centre of the Church of England is, well, we're the church, we, we, we're the leaders of the church, we were put here by God, we must be able to sort everything out. Um, what you really want is the first and foremost, what the, what the leadership of the church needs to do is listen, sit down with people who have been hurt and listen to them and ask them what's go, gone wrong. You can't rebuild trust by having a vote or creating a new policy or spending a bit more money on the national safeguarding team. Relationships have to be rebuilt in person. It's astonishing for Mr X, for instance, who I mentioned, that his initial abuse happened 40 years ago. The story of the church's re-abuse goes re on and on and on. Nobody in a pastoral role in the church has ever sat down with him and with his family and said, how are you? What have we done to you? How can we put this right? There is no means for doing that. Be good to hear from other members of the Synod if you if you want to kind of come in on that and just respond to Andrew. But half an hour before we started this, Andrew, there was a press release saying that Professor Alexis J, former chair of the Independent Inquiry into Child Sexual Abuse, has been appointed by the Archbishops of Canterbury and York on behalf of the Archbishops Council to lead a programme of work to recommend a model for fully independent safeguarding with the Church of England which is very high stakes, it's, it's got to work. That's as high as you can get, I, I guess, for an intervention. And she has said in a, in a statement, I have explained that if I detect any attempt to interfere with or to hinder my work, I will withdraw from this programme of work immediately. Um, your response to the fact that she's been brought in to create this structure? Um, well, Professor Jay is a very senior figure, and so is John O'Brien, who was the secretary to... Ixa, but you say this is as high stakes as it could get. No, really as high stakes as it would get would be to go to an organisation and say, do this for us, please. Set up our independence. What the church has actually said is, please would you give us an opinion by the end of the year on what we should do. Now that might help to cover the church's immediate embarrassment over the dismissal of the independent safeguarding board, but it does nothing to address the, the acute situation of victims and survivors of church abuse. And uh, it gives no security that there will be proper independence. Uh, a, a survivor's just been in touch with me a few moments ago saying, while they've been busy making these arrangements, so they look good, no one has discussed what's happening to my review. No one has discussed what's happening to my data. Nobody has been in touch to ask how I am. So it's still top down rather than survivor up. I just wonder why is the church so afraid of independence? Uh, and the second question related to that, I wonder is, is it difficult for a group of people who believe they are good people um, to acknowledge that even good people make mistakes and need checks? And is there an element of self-righteousness in the church here saying, well, we are different from everything else? But I don't understand why they're so opposed now to a truly, as you were suggesting, a truly independent organisation. It seems to be the only way forward. And an organisation that, you know, the church can attend to a number of things that Andrew has raised, such as uh, on an individual and parish basis, appointing people to talk to those who are abused or in diocesan basis. They can get on and do that just in a pastoral sense. But in that wider sense, why this opposition to an independent organisation? I think, Roger, that it's almost literally theological. I think there is some inbuilt sense in the hierarchy of the Church of England that 
we must have the answers within ourselves. We must, because we've been appointed by God, we must be able to fix this ourselves. Now, funny enough, the bishops don't take the same view when it comes to, say, medical matters. If a bishop falls ill, they don't call another group of bishops round to see if they can uh, find a way of treating them. They go out and they get external expertise. But there is a sense that I, uh, there may also uh, so there's a second and a third um, uh, dimension to it. Uh, the second dimension is that it may be that they realise that the extent of abuse historically within the church is so huge that they don't want to open that can of worms that uh, I mean for some other churches it has been uh, financially and reputationally devastating and it may be that they don't want to go there but I think um, uh, uh, yeah, Andrew Brown has just made a point that there's a confusion between safeguarding the preventative sense which the church on the whole does pretty well for such a large and complex organisation and the business of what happens when it goes wrong. What do we do when, when, when we've messed up? That's the bit that they do uh, uh, so terribly badly. Mm. I wish the bishops, <laughs> I'll finish on this, I wish the bishops would just see that their life would be so much easier if, if that dimension was handled independently. Most bishops I know spend vast amounts of time and energy and emotion dealing with safeguarding failures. If only they could outsource that to a truly independent organisation, their lives might be easier too. Did anything at the Synod uh, convince you that things will improve in the future? Did it put forward the arguments that you've been making for independence and listening, or did it detract from it? I'm beyond um, being interested in the future. The church is endlessly saying, this is what we're going to do tomorrow. We'll set up a redress scheme sometime in the future. We'll have an independent safeguarding body sometime in the future. We'll listen to victims and survivors sometime in the future. Nobody, nobody believes a word of that anymore. I'll only believe what I actually see happening. Thank you. Um, we've got two hands up, but um, Helen, I'd like to go to Jane Ozan first, if I may, and shift on to living in love and faith and the long running discussion in the church on same sex marriage. And so this time, um, well, actually, I'll, I'll get Francis to explain what happened at Synod, Francis, on living in love and faith. In short, very little. You know, there was there was discussion, there was a, a presentation on it, but the the headline really was wait until November where we've got a, an extra uh, edition of Synod in order to uh, go through substantive pr uh, proposals that have yet to be uh, announced and I, I understand yet to be agreed or even properly argued about amongst the bishops. Um, again, adding to that sense of frustration, they're really, you know, we were, we were hearing a lot, of, a lot of sort of discussions, there was plenty of questions, don't think really any new points came up. Um, I don't didn't hear anything on the debate that I hadn't heard several times before over the previous months, really, um, which begs the question, why can't we sort of move forward and get on with something um, mm. one way or another? Thank you. And um, so moving on to Jane Ozan. Um, Jane, what was your reflection on the way that that section of the agenda went? Well, as Francis said, I don't think we heard very much that's new. But if I may, Ruth, I, I, I think if you'll allow me and, and stop me, if, if not, we've got three very different problems playing out in the Church of England. And we are in crisis right now. And that's because of long standing problems on, on as I say, in three different areas. The first is the way that Synod is being managed, which you touched on, and we see that with the number of presentations that were given, where we're not having debates anymore, when we're just being able to ask questions. And that was how the safeguarding uh, problem was, um, was put to Synod, i.e. I, it was a presentation for the Archbishop's Council, and indeed uh, on LLF, where it was a presentation by eight straight people. Synod wasn't able to give its voice. 
And that's been a problem over the last 10 years. It's been growing and each uh, business committee debate, I and others have stood up and said, we don't, this isn't how to, to, to use us. Um, it's not a good use of our time and trust is being broken as a result. Now, why is that the case? That's the second piece of the jigsaw, which is we have, as Andrew said, a very disparate understanding of authority in the church. We've got the House of Bishops, the Archbishop's Council, and actually what you have are groups of good meaning people who come together, far too large a group, no organisation or business would normally manage itself this way. They only meet every two months. Um, they try and look at a business agenda. It's far too big. They don't have time to go through it. And so people are sat on the Archbishop's Council. We make decisions, but not as, not as experts, but as well-meaning people trying to look at the best. But the real power is in a small cabal. And I talked about this in Synod, which is the Archbishops and William Nye. And people know that, but don't know how to manage that. And, when, and that is where the trust issue is. Now, if you add on to that the divides in the church between, let's call us the progressives and the conservatives, and the lack of trust between those two, you've got an absolute pressure cooker. And that's why I, and, and again others, in the business committee debate, asked for a pause so we could have an emergency debate on the state of the church. I didn't want to call it a no confidence debate, but it's fast become that. And the only way that Synod gets managed is through its standing orders. And we saw those standing orders being used against Synod constantly over the last five days. So that again undermined trust. So I'm sorry to give you the bigger picture, but there's no way we're going to be able to move forward on LLF or indeed on safeguarding. And I do slightly disagree with Andrew. Actually, I do think uh, that bringing in Jay is the best thing they could have done, Alexis Jay. And that there is a move to independence, because I think they have got that, but time will tell. But ultimately, on other issues, we aren't going to move forward until we have a mechanism where we can learn to actually trust each other. And I don't know what the answer to that is. Um, I think it's probably going to be in the margins where people like Debbie and I and John Dunnett and Helen King sit down and try and work this out between ourselves. OK, can I go, go first of all to Marcus and then Debbie and then Helen, please. Marcus, you had your hand up. Actually, I was putting my thumbs up um, <laughs> to, um, to back what Jane was saying, though I would say one of the most interesting things about the Synod is the way in which actually there was a curious unity across many of the different factions. Um, and actually both, to use the language that Jane was using, both the progressives and the traditionalists are equally frustrated with the way in which Synod is being managed and about the total collapse of trust. And I think that the, the Synod, because it was so fractious, actually really highlighted the fundamental weakness that we see in the governance of the Church of England, which the governance review that was put for a tiny little debate at the back end of a Sunday, um, on the one hand attempts to deal with and on the other hand exacerbates um so you have you know you have 17 enormous proposed uh, 17 enormous recommendations that are discussed in the end in 24 minutes by four people all backing them um and and any attempt to suggest that they should be discussed one by one or uh, or a, a, a sort of in a sustained way is voted down because as they said from the podium, they were afraid that Synod might mess with them, might change them, might take some out. And that actually revealed it all. Synod is a threat. Synod is, if it actually could wield its powers, could disrupt plans that are just rolling ahead, whatever happens. And the sort of sofa government, I think that was the Blair, the term when Tony Blair was prime minister, the sofa government that exists right at the top of the Archbishop's Council, has a whole series of plans that it wants to get through, and it just works out the best way to do it. And of course, the frustration that's felt at Synod is that you don't have the opportunity to challenge them, you don't have the opportunity really quite often to speak against them. You don't, when questions are held, they are incredibly managed, you're not allowed to ask for opinions, you're not allowed to ask for any legal facts. Um, the, 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 the sheer way in which Synod is run is, in order to allow people to let off steam and then vote through the things that they're being 
asked to do. And of course, the more that that happens, the more people get annoyed and the more everything gets fractious. And then when there's a blow up, like a safeguarding situation with the Archbishop's Council, you find Synod thinking, well, we've theoretically got responsibility over this, but we have literally no mechanism properly to discuss this or to do anything about it. Thanks, Marcus. Going on to Debbie, Debbie Bugs, and Debbie, you are one of the chairs at the Synod uh, as well. Is there a yes. cabal? There's not a cabal in the chairing. Um, but I think Marcus makes a good point, and I'm one of the minority who's frustrated. But let me give you an example of where there was an opportunity for Synod to say, no more, pre we take presentations. So there was a report on climate change um, from the National Investment Board, and someone basically stood up and said, we're fed up of presentations, let's vote to go on to next business, which would have been a clear signal that we are really unhappy with this. But that person failed to get the votes they needed to move on to next business. So what frustrates me is we've got people like Jane, we've got people like Marcus, um, basically wanting to rattle, rattle things up, but yet we're not carrying a majority of synod with us to do that and um, so it's almost like you've got a parliament with a completely ineffective opposition uh because it's under resort well it, it has to find its own resources you say um that uh you've got an ineffective opposition but every time that synod votes like it voted in favor of the the prayers living in love and faith in february and ever since then there's been a reaction from evangelicals who won't accept the decision of synod so you you've got an opposition it doesn't win but it it never gives up doesn't accept the decision so what's wrong there Yes, and I can see that's frustrating for the people who 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 won. Um, but the the evangelicals, of which I'm one, or um, uh, want proper provision in whatever comes to pass. So I think what you're seeing now is um, people saying, "Well, you made this sound easy, bishops, but there's a whole load more you've got to do if you want to keep us together." And actually, I think the delays in the uh, living in love and faith, um, which led to such a kind of just a status update on living in love and faith in in July, uh, almost the bishops recognising that they've bitten off more than they can treat, treat bitten off more than than they can chew. They they need to do more work on the legal stuff, on the doctrine stuff, and on the pastoral 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 provision stuff and i know jane disagrees with me but that is a view held by a substantial section of general synod can i just ask you one more question before we go on to, to helen who's got her hand up and that is in the process of chairing the debates because mm. we've heard that allegations that um the, the debates are manipulated that there are meetings beforehand with the business council and the archbishop's council that you you decide or you may know whose voices you're going to call um you you know what procedural motions may come up you manipulate it in order to get what this cabal wants to happen is that true no no it isn't um so the so i'm a volunteer on the panel of chairs um we get sent round a timetable before synod um, which has got the various items on and some time frames, which is a little bit more detailed than the agenda that goes round to everyone else. Um, but it's basically the synod synod staff's best guess at how long something will take. So opening worship, they know is going to take 15 minutes. Legislative business, if it's a, a quick thing, that'll take 20 minutes. Some things will take an hour, and that's just their best feel at the time but of course if then people put in amendments then that automatically expands the time needed to debate something satisfactory so where the chair comes in is to say well actually i've now got an item to debate and it's got six amendments i need to allocate my time between six amendments do i do lots of speeches on the initial motion or do I do a couple there and then more on the motion as amended at the end? So that is a that is a judgment, and um, hopefully we get it right most of the time. 
It's a thankless task, but you uh, the chairs actually volunteer to do it. That was another. You're not selected by anyone, volunteered. So, th thank you, Debbie. Mm -hmm. um, Helen Helen King has her hand up at this point. Yes, there's so many things I'd like to say. Um, let's just go on the standing orders thing. So the most depressing thing about this synod was definitely the Sunday afternoon when we were trying to find a standing order that would enable Jazz and Steve to speak. Now, I've been told since that the chair then actually wanted to allow them to speak. And the question was trying to find a standing order. And I know people were in little huddles all over the hall. And I've seen Debbie down with her standing orders and everyone's checking out which one can we use. Let's get up, try that one. Doesn't work. Try that one. Doesn't work. Let's try the one where the two presidents can suspend synod. Oh, dear, only one's here. We can't do that. It went on and on. So the standing orders allegedly were, were, being, used by, were being used by us to try and get what we wanted. But we've also been told from the centre that they really were trying to find a way for Jazz and Steve to speak, in which case, why didn't they suggest a standing order under which it could happen? It's quite bizarre. The standing orders are there to keep us under control. Um, but then when we try and use them, we get into trouble. So Gavin Drake trying to put in a following motion to get some independence um, in the safeguarding situation, then that was timed out. When we have amendments, as Debbie says, you have to allow time for those amendments to be debated. But some people shove in amendments all over the place because then they know they're going to be called to speak. I mean, a classic was in the February Synod where someone tried to delete the queue in LGBTQIA+. That's a ridiculous amendment, and they did withdraw it. It's a hideous yeah. game, and it doesn't allow well, real debate. It doesn't allow discussion. That, it's all very technical. Um um, do you really believe that uh, there are groups within the Synod that um, manipulate the agenda in order to get um, their their particular amendments through? In other words, there's there's a, a lack of kind of grace isn't probably the right word, but ability to be open and listen to a debate in order to reach a decision. Is it all so yeah. political it doesn't work anymore? I think, I think it is at that point. Um, I'll give another example from this synod where there was a motion about ex-offenders being released from prison and somebody tried to get an amendment in there about two particular courses, Alpha and Christianity Explored, to commend their use in prison. Now, I didn't like that because to me it, it it lost the point of the motion, which was not about what courses you use in prison. People use lots of courses, and some people, prison chaplains, write bespoke courses for their own prisoners. That seems reasonable. So putting that in seemed to me to dilute the motion. But there was also, of course, the thing that just before Synod, the Holy Trinity Brompton group who produced Alpha had come out saying that they were against the prayers of love and faith. So that immediately makes the thing into something about LLF, a living in love and faith process. And so it gets to the point where you can't really discuss the thing you're discussing because some people are trying to vote against it for a particular reason. Other people don't understand why they're trying to. But again, it's that thing where the amendment comes in and therefore someone has to speak to the amendment and the whole discussion starts to get sidetracked. I'm amazed how many different things that happened in Synod were somehow weaponized to be about the prayers of love and faith. Uh, and I don't think that's helpful. Thank you, Helen. I wonder if we could just lift it away from um, the operation of Synod for a moment. We, we have some commentators on the call who weren't actually there, but watch what happened. And one of those is the Reverend Stephen Parsons from Surviving Church. Thank you for joining us, Stephen. And in the blog that you wrote on Reflecting uh, Synod, you said, last Sunday at General Synod in York, something seemed to crack. The power dynamics that have kept the members of the Church of England hierarchy firmly in charge shifted significantly to favour voices from the floor in a de uh, decisive way. Um, can you explain what you meant by that? What you feel that you saw in that Synod debate on the Sunday? Well, in some way, um, the power of the chair, the power of the chair, the power of the Archbishop's Council was under challenge. And it seemed to me that the, the very act of having that whole business of um, standing orders to find a way that um, Steve and um, Sanghera could speak was an example of actually making a tremendous effort to actually say something which could be heard and heard by that somebody referred to it, the inner cabal, 
who seem to have, get their own way all the time. And there is, a, I'm very interested in the dynamics of the synod and the way that there seems to be power jostling for position. And it seemed to me that something gave at that point, the, the, the ordinary voice was heard and made a difference. And, and, and it, it, the power that has controlled the agenda and the business and all the rest of it seemed to, as it were, stand back a bit. And that was significant. I don't, I don't know whether I was right to say something cracked, but somebody commented on the blog, well, it, it may have cracked, but it didn't shatter, but I still think it was significant. It felt that the little voice mm -hmm. was bigger. In what way will it change things in the future, this significant moment? I think the authority of the bishops, um, and partic in particular the archbishops, has been challenged. They can't get away with well, deference has been, as it were, challenged and undermined in some way. I think bishops are seen as people who themselves have enormous pressures. And that one of the most important things they do, which has become very difficult to do recently, is to defend the um, integrity of the institution. Mm. The institution is under, is under challenge. Um, mm. And that seems to be, to be something which is never be quite the same again. Thank you, Stephen. There was another comment, this time by Theo Hobson, uh, the, the author and, and writer, um, who picked up what the, the um, Bishop of Dover, Rose Hudson Wilkins, said. Um, and this was about um, uh, bishops. And she said, actually, the women bishops thing, alternative oversight with a different bishop, she meant, ain't working and we are paying the price. And this is about how you deal with divisions in the Church of England, whether you build a parallel structure of bishops, uh, because the bishops have given up being united, that it's it's a lost cause. Um, and um, and Theo Hobson, that's what he was saying, that he felt that the bishop was saying we must seek uh, unity, come what may, and not manage division. So who can I bring in this? Andrew Carey, um, editor of the Church of England newspaper. This, um, which is a, a primarily for evangelicals, I believe that's right in saying, within the, the Church of England. What do you make of moves within the evangelical tradition in the Church of England to create a parallel structure of bishops simply because they know that they can't reach agreement through the structures that are in place at the moment? Yeah, I don't think evangelicals are all of one mind um, on, on, on these issues. Um, Debbie spoke about, you know, a lot of evangelicals on synod who do who who will be looking for the sort of alternatives uh, episcopal oversight i think those those ideas are in development um and i i think a lot of evangelicals are in the position of saying we're part of the church ring and we're not giving up our church um and you know some would say it's it's for the other side to 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 have the alternative episcopal oversight where we're still in the mainstream so it's you know i i i I think um, I'd, I think there's 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 a long way to go. Um, there's still a November synod, I and mean, what I'm interested in is some of the things being talked about at this this meeting. You know, the existence of sofa government. I mean, none of us who are long in the tooth on on reporting the church, um, you know, see. I, I mean, issues of trust and you know um, and and disputes between the church authorities. And general synod have always been there. There's been sort of debacles, there's been skirmishes, and there's been atrocities along, along the way over the years with reports rejected, archbishops defeated, and all sorts of things going on. I think there is something about sofa government, there's something about manipulation that is that is much more recent. I, I'm I've always been with Jane on on the issue of presentations. I don't think you should have any. Um, I think synod should just do its job. Um, and I think things are blowing. I think there's a, you know, there, there's, I, I will be fascinated to see what happens in November, because I think this is either the beginning of that or, or, or the ecclesiastical authorities sit and take, uh, sit up and take notice, um, because I think oh. um, it could get worse. So, but what would actually happen in November if they sat up and took notice, Andrew? What would the bishops do? I think they perhaps have a little more respect for general synod members. I think you do see a lot of hectoring and haranguing of synod members from the chairs. I, I, I don't say that's that's true of you, Debbie, but um, 
but you know th that does happen quite a bit um people are giving up their time and um they're treated with contempt i mean lay members are are told that they're not representative and that kind of thing all the time and um you know so th the, the, there's all sorts of of things going on that that are really unworthy of the church of england in, in the way they treat um synod there's been a, a reduction of um church house staff which has resulted in a, a huge degree of incompetence on the part of um of the way synod operates um and the and i think that's to do with the you know with with late um posting of questions and things like that but there's been a corresponding growth of um of uh, of staff at, in the archbishop's palaces bishop thorpe and lambeth and much more staff have come under their wing so i i think there's a whole load of things to sort out um, this is not an easy one, but I think synod members have to stand up for themselves. I suppose the question, I don't know if you want to take this, Andrew, or, or perhaps bring in Simon Sarmiento on this. The question is, will changing the governance structure, which is the proposal that Synod agreed to, creating this Church of England National Services in, in place of various other bodies, committees, structures that exist at the moment, is that the goal, is that the silver bullet? Is that the thing that will change? No, I could see shaking of the head. Marcus, do you want to come in on that? As um, and then, no, I don't think it'll change. I don't, I don't think it's a silver bullet at all. In fact, part of the reason is that, and I, I think there hasn't been a real understanding of one of the tension points that's really come out and actually really came out over the course of this synod which is the way in which the Church of England operates as, say, and this is a slightly clumsy way of putting it, but I'm going to do it anyway, a, a part of the state. So PCCs are elected, and the members of the PCCs are elected representatives of their uh, community. Members of Deanery Diocese and, and indeed General Synod are elected, and they have they represent people, they represent people who've... Um, they, 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 they've committed to do things in their manifestos. Members of the Archbishop's Council who come from Synod are one way or the other elected and they might or might not have particular mandates and are expected to represent the people who put them there. Spin that all around, all of these institutions are also charities. If you're on the PCC, you are a charitable trustee and have a fiduciary duty to that trust, which may differ from the interests and needs of the people who've elected you there. Archbishop's Council, and this is where the rub's really coming, are the members of Archbishop's Council, have the, is their primary duty to the charity of which they're a trustee or to the people who put them there who are now getting angry and saying, actually, you know, there's a lot of talk. Can we have motions of no confidence in our representatives? This is going to be true all the way through. That's the rubbing point all the way through the governance uh, report. And we're seeing that with attempts to diminish who can stand for various positions, with nominations committees to vet people to ensure that they've got the right qualifications that may or may not involve thumbs being put on elections in order to ensure that the right trustees are there, but not necessarily the representative people are on those bodies. I think that the tensions that we've seen as to who guards the guardians, who actually has oversight, who can actually call people to account will actually be exacerbated by the by the governance review and indeed proposals, as we're seeing, not, um, not made good. What is the silver bullet then, Marcus? What is the silver bullet? I mean, I'm not sure I'm a believer in silver bullets. Um, I would say the more openness and transparency there is and the more open debate and the more that people can actually be challenged and the more that people are willing to accept challenge and that that means tough questions and that means debates where enough people are actually given enough time to speak and where there's a real ability to try and tease out these questions properly would help but um i'm not sure there's a silver bullet for a complex organization like ours and maybe the absence of silver bullets is a safeguard against dominance by sofa government government yes. Thank you. We haven't heard from Simon Sarmiento uh, from Thinking Anglicans. Um, the same question to you, I suppose, Simon. What will what could happen to make things improve? 
Well, I'd like to pick up a point that Andrew Carey just made about staff, um, as opposed to Archbishop's Council members. If I can go, go back to the original safeguarding debacle episode, which was the sacking of these ISP people, and we learned over the time period and when that was first announced up until now, that actually that was an ongoing row for 18 months. Uh, and many people said it, it should have been uh, stopped, but it should have been stopped much sooner, and then the damage would have been less, and so forth. But what I don't understand, well, I do understand, I think, is why was it allowed to go on? What were the staff that worked for the Archbishop's Council, and I'm starting with the Secretary General and then working down, what were they all doing during that period, and why was it allowed to carry on for so long? I think one of the things that is very definitely the case is that there are no longer among church house staff people who've been there for years. Andrew will remember people who were there 10 years ago, 15 years ago, whenever we started meeting, <laughs> I can't remember, um, who had you know, already worked for church commissioners and worked for church house Westminster for a couple of decades before I met them. And almost all these people no longer exist. They've all retired. They've all gone away. And there isn't the corporate memory of how the Church of England has been run in the past available in church house anymore. I think that's a key issue which needs to be addressed. And gov changing, changing the format of who on the Archbishop's Council replacement sits there from elected from this body or that body, all of those people are amateurs. What we want is some professional managers in church house who can actually do things. And we clearly didn't have them when it came to the ISB. But managing issues is, is one thing, but changing the culture of the place to one of trust and so forth, how is that done, I suppose, is the last question to put to anyone who'd like to answer it on the call. Uh, we've been through it with Marcus. Uh, Jane, is there a silver bullet? What needs to be done to change the level of trust? Well, I do think, uh, I'm, a, I'm going to be frank, I think the thing is imploding, and I think actually the church needs to implode for something new uh, and uh, spirit-filled to move forward. I was trying to hint in the ch in the chat that we have become very legalistic in our structures and a whole way of working, which is different to many other denominations which are truly led by grace. And I do think the Ecclesiastical Committee has a role to play. You'll have seen in the chat, I've been talking about the role of Parliament. They are very angry. Sir Peter Bottomley this morning in church commissioners questions has said to the Church of England if you don't sort yourselves out we will for you and we will take you out of the Equalities Act. I think Parliament are perhaps I don't know if they're a magic bullet but I think they're a player in this because they can see the the way the Church of England is is, is sadly imploding and I think um, putting it bluntly our finances are going down the amount of work we're acquiring our central structures is going up the amount of money that survivors are going to need is going up and the amount of abuse cases that are still to come out will also be going up. The picture is not bleak and I think we, sorry, the picture is bleak and uh, I think we may need to um, look at some really drastic restructuring uh, if we are going to find a way of giving the gospel to uh, England. I think God, we have to ask what God's doing, which is much bigger than all this. Thank you. So on to Debbie next and then Clive afterwards. So I think the silver bullet is to return to the apostolic faith as we've received it, um, to the Gospels, to the epistles um, and to um, to go back to first principles. I think um, if we did that, uh, we could um, get things sorted out. Thank you. Clive, do you have any reflections? You are on the audit committee of the Archbishop's Council, so you are involved. I am indeed. I, I'm effectively an onlooker to some of this. There, there's an old saying that the auditors come along after the battle and bayonet the survivors. Um, and this, this can be a danger being in this role. But one of the things is that you often watch things unrolling. And it's interesting, this issue that say the ISB was going on for so long because it's on the public record that the audit committee tried to intervene um, last year and we weren't able to. I think one of the problems I put into the chat is that of course we're not the Church of England, we're the Churches of England because there are 42 Churches of England 
because many times we're told that things can't be dealt with through general synod because it's a matter for each individual charity. And so we have difficulties in our structure. Um, and if you imagine trying to run Tesco's with 42 regional offices, um, how, how much control you'd have from the centre in that position, I'm not quite sure. Um, but I think the key thing we've come through is it is about trust and suspicion. And it's too easy always to see conspiracy when actually it's, it is just um, cock up. And that, that's unfortunate. And the thing I'd like to say, because it's on the record, is that one of the issues with the church house staff, they are incredibly helpful and they're also incredibly overworked. And whenever you deal with them, they're nothing but helpful to you but you get the sense of how overworked they are, how much pressure there is on them, and th this must be causing problems. Thank you, Clive. I'm going to give the final word to uh, Roger Bolton. Um, you've been commentating on the Church of England for many years, Roger. I wonder what you make of the discussion today and uh, the events in the Church of England in the last 10 days. Well, I'm on my PCC and I'm a the Deanery Synod representative and, and uh, I could go on about the problems of deanery sinners but no a great sadness very great sadness at, at seeing what's happening uh, but the one thing and you're well two things really one is what the church is going through now is going through most of the major institutions in the country i, I think if you look at the bbc if you look at the whole range there's a there's a lack of trust uh, 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 and also one of the rather disappointing in the nhs trusts for example where you had trustees clearly failing in their duties in Shrewsbury and a whole range of other places. Uh, you look at the latest things about police commissioners and so on. So we've got a we, church has a particular responsibility, but it should look at the wider question that trust is, is, is in short supply almost everywhere. And this tension between, uh, between giving a range of voices and giving a proper um, opportunity to speak and giving leadership at the same time requires an almost superhuman person. Nobody's referred to the fact that this particular Archbishop of Canterbury, whatever you think of him, must be coming to the end, must can't be far off the end of his tenure. Uh, and therefore, the person, these things, you know, do start at the top as well as the bottom. And, and therefore, this election of the future, or the, not the election, the appointment of the future Archbishop of Canterbury is absolutely fundamental. And... Uh, you know, I think trust can only be restored if somebody comes in who is relatively untouched by the past with a clear view of what they wish to achieve. But I think this is a crisis that is happening throughout society in a whole range of ways, not just within the Church of England. The sadness is that we all hope the Church of England would do rather better and engender a greater level of trust than some other organisations. Thank you, Roger. Um... As as uh, usual, uh, very glad to give you the last word on uh, on this <laughs> discussion. Um, thank you to everybody who's taken part. It's such a shame that we didn't have any bishops taking part, and that wasn't for want of trying. But hopefully, when we return to this, as we will do, I'm sure, in the autumn, uh, you'll come back, and uh, we'll persuade some of the bishops to join us then. So, thank you very much for your time, everyone. And have a great summer. We'll be back in September unless a big story breaks in the meantime.